India. If you're going on a gap year, if you're planning on traveling, go to India. It's the most, one of the most extraordinary countries on this planet. I was there to go and live. We were filming a series called Extreme Pilgrim. And I was to go and live with the holy men of India. The holy men and women of India live on the streets. They've taken a vow of poverty. They own nothing. They have a bag, they have a staff, and they have clothes. And that's it. They don't own anything else at all. And I was to meet these gentlemen at the Kumbha Mela. The Kumbha Mela is a festival that's held once every 12 years. The biggest festival in this country takes place just up the road from here in Glastonbury. The busiest day in Glastonbury, there'll be a quarter of a million people there. At the Kumbha Mela, on the busiest day, there are 24 million people who tip up to this festival. A huge makeshift city made of tents <coughs> on the banks of the Ganges. It takes three months to build it and three months to take it down. And about kind of eight weeks before the festival begins, the holy men and women of India who spend their lives, uh, well, if they're under 50, they spend their lives walking between villages and between cities. They don't cut their hair, they don't shave their beards. They start to arrive. And I met the two men that I was going to be with for the next three or four weeks. And um, they, they showed me around uh, through this city. They then took me to their camp to meet their guru. All Indian holy men and women have a guru. It's rather like the parish priest system here. Um, that's how it works. I have to report to a bishop. They have to report to a guru. And so I was shown into this kind of large tent. I was stripped naked. Uh, and I was given a kakoi to wear. And they put a necklace around my neck with one seed on it, which meant that I was a novice sadhu. And anyone in India seeing that seed would know that I was a novice sadhu and I would be treated accordingly. Um, I then went to meet the guru who sat on this kind of slightly raised platform. And he was quite a large gentleman. And, and he spent most of the day just sitting there cross-legged. In the middle, if you can imagine, going to a festival with 24 million people, the racket is extraordinary. The noise is absolute. Absolutely phenomenal. One of the traditions of the holy men of India is that they smoke a lot of dope. Um, they were very clear about the fact that cannabis is not a recreational drug and should never be used recreationally. We abuse what they see as a holy substance in the West. I was sitting around the fire with them in the evening uh, and they lit, there were all these pipes full of cannabis going round and it came to me and I looked at the director and I kind of said, what are they And he went, so I took a huge great slug, got incredibly stoned very, very quickly and then we talked into the night and they talked, you know, we talked till four or five in the morning. After about three or four days of this, and the constant racket, none of us had slept. You know, I'd been up for three days, stoned out of my mind. And, and then I, I was, one morning I was sitting around the fire, and the guru was sitting up on his platform. And he said to me, Mr. Peter, you don't look very well. What's the matter with you? And I said, well, I can't sleep. I said, none of us can sleep. And he went, you can't sleep? Why not? And I said, because, well, I mean, you know, the racket, the noise is absolutely extraordinary. And it was, it was like being in the middle of a cup final. And he got quite, I could see he was getting quite impatient with me. He was getting quite, quite upset. And so he stood up and he picked up the mat that he was sitting on. And then outside our camp was a thoroughfare, uh, about as wide as two of these tables. And it was constantly used, night and day, people walking up and down. And he walked into the middle of the thoroughfare, put his mat down on the ground, and he lay down on it. 
and he went to sleep. People walking on him, treading on him, racket. And I was leaning up against a corrugated iron fence just to make sure he wasn't faking it. But he was out like a baby, sleeping. And then I went back in to get a cup of chai. And then a couple of hours later, he came back in looking a bit bleary-eyed. And he called me over. And he said, you, you call yourself a priest? You call yourself a holy man? You can't even sleep when you want to? You are a baby. You have so much to learn. And he was right. He was right. After three and a half weeks, going around from town to town with these extraordinary men, one of the most vivid experiences of my life, I got very sick. And so we had to cut the filming short by a day, and we were on our way back to Delhi to fly home to get me to a doctor. And we stopped in this village. And there are lots of wonderful villages in India, and they're just full and teeming, teeming with life and colour. And our translator, we'd stopped to buy some water and, and some bananas, and our translator called me over. And she said, Peter, Peter, come and see what I found. And so I crossed the road, and she was sitting um, on a raised concrete platform. Next to her was a man who must have been about 24 or 25. And he was cradling a baby girl in his arms. On the concrete, there was another smaller girl, uh, a girl of about two or three who was just skipping around this concrete. And in the corner, there was a girl of about six or seven who was cooking. She was cooking a meal. And he explained to me that he'd been a small farm, and India has lots of small farms, and that his wife had become sick, had become unwell. And so to pay for medicine, because they don't have a national health service, to pay for medicine he'd had to sell his cow and he'd had to sell much of his farm equipment. And she became gravely unwell. And so he had to sell his farm to pay for hospital treatment for her. And she died. She died. And he was a widower looking after these three young girls. And he had nothing. He had nothing. He was begging. And no point during the conversation, at no point during the story, did he ask, ask for them. And so we listened, and we thanked him, and then the translator said, Pete, we, we, we've got to go back to the van now. And so we stood up to go, and he put his hand on my shoulder, and he said, no, please, please stay and eat with us. And so... We sat down again, and in India you eat with your hands, you don't have knives and forks. And I was given a little rice and some okra, some beans, and we ate. This man had nothing. And yet he was prepared to share what he had with a stranger, from a foreign land that he'd never met before and I will never, if I do in my life, experience such an act of generosity, I will be a lucky man. And it challenged me down to the core of who I am. We have so much here in this land but how much do we give of the vast amount that we have 
I'm not asking you that to make you feel guilty. I'm asking you that to ask, so you ask yourselves about your own capacity for generosity. And I wish we'd film that. <laughs>